Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Lisa, and I'm here to share some devotionals with all of you. This is a continuation of the sufferings of Christ. This is part seven, and the title is Christ's Death. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah 53, verses 8 and 9. Christ felt much as sinners will feel when the vials of God's wrath shall be poured out upon them. Black despair, like the pall of death, will gather about their guilty souls, and then they will realize to the fullest extent the sinfulness of sin. Salvation has been purchased for them by the suffering and death of the Son of God. It might be theirs if they would accept it willingly, gladly, but none are compelled to yield obedience to the law of God. If they refuse the heavenly benefit, if they choose the pleasures and deceitfulness of sin, they can have their choice, and at the end receive their wages which is the wrath of God and eternal death. Faith and hope tremble in the expiring agonies of Christ, because God has removed the assurance he had heretofore given his beloved Son of his approbation and acceptance. The Redeemer of the world now relies upon the evidences which had hitherto strengthened him, that is, sorry, that his father accepted his labors and was pleased with his work. In his dying agony, as he yields up his precious life, he has by faith alone to trust in him who it has ever been his joy to obey. He is not cheered with clear bright rays of hope on the right hand nor on the left. All is enshrouded in oppressive gloom, amid the awful darkness which is felt by sympathizing nature. The Redeemer drains the mysterious cup even to its dregs. Denied even bright hope and confidence in the triumph which will be his in the future, he cries with a loud voice, Lord, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He is acquainted with the character of his Father, his justice, his mercy, and great love. In submission he drops into the hands of his Father. Amid the convulsions of nature are heard by the amazed spectators the dying words of the man of Calvary. Nature sympathized with the suffering of its author, the heaving earth, The rent rocks and the terrific darkness proclaimed that it was the Son of God that died. There was a mighty earthquake. The veil of the temple was rent in twain. Terror seized the executioners and spectators as they beheld the sun veiled in darkness and felt the earth shake beneath them and saw and heard the rending of the rocks. The mocking and jeering of the chief priests and elders were hushed as Christ commended his spirit into the hands of his Father. The astonished throng began to withdraw and grope their way in the darkness to the city. They smote upon their breasts as they went, and in terror, speaking scarcely above a whisper, said among themselves, It is an innocent person that has been murdered. What if, indeed, he is, as he asserted, the Son of God? And that's the end of part seven. In part eight, 
and this is titled Christ's Victory. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. John 19 verse 30 Jesus did not yield up his life till he had accomplished the work which he came to do, and exclaimed with his departing breath, It is finished. Satan then was defeated. He knew that his kingdom was lost. Angels rejoiced as the words were uttered, It is finished. The great plan of redemption, which was dependent on the death of Christ, had been thus far carried out, and there was joy in heaven that the sons of Adam could, through a life of obedience, be finally exalted to the throne of God. Oh, what love, what amazing love, that brought the Son of God to earth to be made sin for us, that we might be reconciled to God and elevated to a life with Him in His mansions in glory. Oh, what is man that such a price should be paid for His redemption? When men and women can more fully comprehend the magnitude of the great sacrifice which was made by the majesty of heaven in dying in man's stead, then will the plan of salvation be magnified and reflections of Calvary will awaken tender, sacred and lively emotions in the Christian's heart. Praises to God and the Lamb will be in their hearts and upon their lips. Pride and self-esteem cannot flourish in the heart that keeps fresh in memory the scenes of Calvary. This world will appear of but little value to those who appreciate the cost of man's redemption. All the riches of the world are not of sufficient value to redeem one perishing soul. Who can measure the love of Christ felt for a lost world? As he hung upon the cross, suffering for the sins of guilty men, this love was immeasurable. It was infinite. His love he has shown was stronger than death, he was accomplishing man's salvation, and although he had the most fearful conflict with the powers of darkness, yet amid it all, his love decreased not, but grew stronger and stronger. He endured the hidings of his father's countenance until he was led to exclaim in the bitterness of his soul, My God! My God, why hast thou forsaken me? His arm brought salvation. The price was paid to purchase the redemption of man when in the last soul struggle the blessed words were uttered which seemed to resound through creation. It is finished. And that's the end of part Eight, and now for part nine, Christ's Gift. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the, f at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Hebrews 2 verse 3. How many who profess to be Christians will become excited over some worldly enterprise? Their interest is awakened for new and exciting amusements, while they are cold-hearted and appear as if frozen in the cause of God. But here is a theme. Poor formalist, which is of sufficient importance to excite you. Eternal interests are here involved. To be calm and unimpassioned on this theme is even sinful. The scenes of Calvary call for the deepest emotions. Upon this subject, 
you will be excusable if you manifest enthusiasm that Christ, so excellent, so innocent, should suffer such a painful death, bearing the weight of the sins of the world, our most extended thoughts and imaginations can never be able to fully reach and enable us to comprehend the length, the breadth, the light, the depth of such amazing love. The contemplation of the matchless depths of a Savior's love, viewed by faith, fills and absorbs the mind, touches and melts the soul, refines and elevates the affections, and completely transforms the whole character. The language of the Apostle is, I determine not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We may look toward Calvary and also exclaim, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Considering at what an immense cost our salvation has been purchased, what will be the fate of those who neglect so great salvation? What will be the punishment of those who profess to be followers of Christ yet fail to bow in humble obedience to the claims of their Redeemer, and who do not take the cross as humble disciples of Christ and follow him from the manger to Calvary. He that gathereth not with me, saith Christ, scattereth abroad. Some have limited views of the atonement. They think that Christ suffered only a small portion of the penalty of the law of God, and that while the wrath of God was felt by his dear Son, they supposed that he had, through all his painful sufferings, an evidence of his Father's love and acceptance, and that the portals of the tomb before him were illuminated with bright hope that he had the abiding evidence of his future glory. Here is a great mistake. Christ's keenest anguish was a sense of his father's displeasure. His mental agony, because of this, was of such intensity that man can have but faint conception of it. And that is the end of these devotionals. I pray you all have a beautiful day in the Lord. God bless each and every one of you. And I will see you either next video or in the air. Bye-bye.